Hi, everyone. I'm Jack Cushwood, Room Now, and this is my big opportunity to rant on the new 2020 ACR guidelines for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. They were presented today. I think there's been a lot of discussion about them so far. It's a long document, a lot of recommendations. You know, uh, the process was long and arduous, I'm sure. 81 PICO questions. This is a, revi a revision of the 2015 guidelines. And the reason to revise them is because thinking is always changing. And certainly we have new drugs. I think there's five new drugs, including ceruliumab, two JAK inhibitors, uh, baricitinib and apatacitinib. So they came up with new guidelines. I want to start by saying congratulations to the committee for their effort. Um, these are good friends, smart people who've done a good job trying to place into some formula how we should manage RA, which is really difficult and takes a lifelong of learning to know how to in fact do. So codifying it in a few pages is almost impossible, which is now my great opportunity to step all over it. I got nothing but red flags and detours on this thing. So I, wait, before I start my rant, let me just get dressed for this. So hold on a second. Uh, stole this from Costco the other day. They didn't seem to miss it. Okay, so here we go. All right, I think I'm ready. I think I'm, everyone gets the message. How do I look, mom? All right, so I'm gonna try to do this fast. Here's my rant. You can go through it on your own pace, but you should note number one, there's a total of 44 recommendations and 37 of which are conditional, meaning it was sort of like this, we had a vote, this is the best we came up with, we couldn't say it's strong, it's conditional, or they're lacking evidence. So that's number one. A lot of these are conditional, it's expert opinion, and you may not agree with the experts. Number two, the language is medieval, my goodness. Conditional this, strongly recommend that, if not long, then short. I mean, it's really when, it re when you read it, or when you have someone else read it to you, it's just painful to listen to. Um, Third, um, you know, DMARD naive patients who have moderate um, to high disease activity, I got no problem with their choices there. It's the usual things, methotrexate, and then moving on. Um, I got a problem with, however, low disease activity. So DMARD naive patients who have low disease activity, they recommend first, hydroxychloroquine. Second, conditionally, of course, uh, sulfasalazine. And sulfasalazine before methotrexate and methotrexate before leflunamide. You may like that idea. That's all about safety. It's not about what works best. Shouldn't you use, especially in DMARD naive patients, your best drug first? Is hydroxychloroquine and sulfasalazine your best drug first? Or is this all about safety? And of course, there's absolutely no data on these choices. This is all about preference. It may be patient preference, and that always trumps physician preference, and we know that. So I got a gripe with that. Methotrexate dosing, they had a lot on this and this drove me, just drove me crazy. So they certainly recommend you should use PO dosing over sub-Q or parenteral dosing. However, if the patient has signs of toxicity, they recommend that you should either go to split dose oral or parenteral sub-Q or increase the dose of folate. By the way, the first two options are idiotic. If the patient's having intolerance by going to sub-Q or any other parenteral form or oral split dosing, you're delivering more drugs. You're gonna get more toxicity, not less. So I'm not sure where these guys came up with that one. Sec the, la the third choice of increasing folic acid, we do it because we don't ever have anything else to do, but that's not shown to work for anything other than drug discontinuations and maybe lowering LFTs and, and that's about it. Look at the Cochrane review on that. So anyway, that drives me crazy. Uh, of course, they want you to do those things before you switch to another DMARD, and that may be your only choice. You know, the next recommendation was if you're not a target, then do treat the target. That's an old recommendation. They thought they had to bring that one out. They say if you're on maximum doses of methotrexate, they recommend that you switch to a biologic or you add in a biologic or a targeted synthetic as opposed to adding in sulfasalazine and hydroxychloroquine and going with triple DMARD therapy what? They want you to go more expensive rather than cheaper? Does Jim O'Dell know about any of this? I don't think he's on the committee. Obviously, the cost-effective measure would be to use simpler therapies. That's actually what's recommended in, in the ULAR guidelines. 
They want you to go with the things that work best. Yes, I think that they may work best, but the evidence of that is, oh, this is all conditional recommendation. There is no evidence for any of that. Next, if you're on a biologic um, or a targeted synthetic and you're not doing well, they suggest you switch to another class. Shouldn't you be allowed to use uh, IL-6 inhibitor twice, a TNF inhibitor twice, uh, even a, a JAK inhibitor twice before you're switching to another class? That guideline didn't seem to make any allowance for that. They have a guideline on tapering, which makes sense. They then go to what they call special populations. This is really special, if you know what I mean. God bless their heart. Nodules, they recommend methotrexate first. Well, that's really special. And if not methotrexate, then another, another non-methotrexate DMARD. There's no evidence of any of this. Again, we all, all of us don't know how to treat nodules, honestly, but to codify it in a recommendation, I think was quite kind of a little bit risky. Um, what about pulmonary disease? Any kind of stable pulmonary disease? They come out and say methotrexate's okay. That's brilliant. We, that's what really should be in there because the risk of methotrexate is a risk for hypersensitivity pneumonitis, not worsening of ILD. Then they talk about heart failure. Class three and four heart failure should be given what treatment? They say a non-TNF biologic. Again, absolutely no evidence for any of that. None. I mean, it's been studied. Patients with RA, you know, with heart disease can take TNF inhibitors just fine. It all comes from the very old Enbrel trial back in about 2002, 2003, the Renaissance study and whatnot, where there were marginal signals there. Um, use your best drug first. Clearly, if someone is on a TNF inhibitor and develops heart failure, yes, switch to another class of medicine. That does make sense. Lymphoproliferative disorder, you say? Yes, rituximab. It's an indication of rituximab. That does make sense. Like they got that one right. Another one they got right was hepatitis B. They're, and these are very smart recommendations. Antiviral therapy is recommended for hepatitis B patients who are hepatitis B core antibody positive and going on rituximab. Doesn't matter what their hep B surface antigen is. Core antibody with a negative hep B surface antigen is a low risk situation. But if you're going on rituximab, it becomes a high risk situation. On the other hand, um, if you have patients who are B surface antigen positive, they need to be on uh, antiviral therapy no matter what, or not take the biologic. And the ones where you can use biologics and targeted synthetics with very low risk, like 2%, are patients who are B surface antigen negative and who have FB core antibody positivity, plus or minus hep B surface antibody positivity. Next, if you have NFALD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's okay to take methotrexate if they are in fact stable. If you are on rituximab um, and you have hypogammaglobulinemia and you've not had infection, you can continue the rituximab. So I like that. They got two that I don't necessarily like. One is, I have to change because my notes are on the side here, a prior serious infectious event, um, they recommend that you use a conventional synthetic DMARD to treat such patients. If they're already on a conventional synthetic DMARD, they suggest you use another conventional synthetic DMARD or add on another as opposed to going to biologic. There's no evidence for that. Here, you're in a very difficult situation. Patient has a serious infectious event or more than one um, and they have active disease. Do you use a biologic where there's this worry of, of infections? And remember, infections is related to number one, inflammation and then the disease. Uh, and then maybe lastly, the drug. So at some point, you might have to take a risk with a more aggressive therapy, either targeted synthetic or biologic in people who are not responding to conventional synthetic DMARDs with the hope that you can control inflammation and lessen infectious risk. Very difficult situation. They've tried to put it to paper. Maybe the actual manuscript will have more granularity on that very difficult management situation. And then lastly, there's no provision in any of the guidelines for risk factors. ULR guidelines still do have poor prognostic risk factors that changes the treatment options, meaning if you're high titer seropositive, if you have extra articular manifestations, if you have erosions, if you failed multiple pre pre prior therapies, that's not in these guidelines because there in fact is some evidence to say that the poor prognostic factors are not quite as meaningful as we make them out to be. Nonetheless, it is a difference between the ACR guidelines and the recently published 2019 ULR guidelines. 
I know I'm going to get into trouble for this one, but that's why I'm wearing this bulletproof safety vest. Hope you enjoyed it. Tune in for more.